With Worlds wrapped up for North America, the offseason has officially kicked off as we head into the 2024 year, and the big storyline of this year is simply budget cuts. Everybody is scaling back on contracts, and everybody is slowly starting to condense around a smaller average salary, which according to Hotline League is under 200000 for the first time, which for context, in 2020, that average salary was about 400 k So we've shrunk in half. And with that comes some potential disparity amongst the teams in the roster building that we could potentially see. Some of the teams are known, some of the teams are not. This video is being recorded as of Tuesday at 6 p.m., so anything that I talk about here is the announcements as of then via the various sheep. Be sure to stick around until the end where I do have a very special announcement that I'm excited for. But kicking it off with Cloud9, the clear super team going into next year. They picked up the best players in almost every single role. Fudge, arguably a top two top laner, despite what people want to complain about in terms of his international success. Blabber, the best jungler in North America when contracts isn't firing on all cylinders. Jojo Pun, your reigning MVP in the mid lane, clearly best mid laner. Uh, in the LCS, he just needed a team, and guess what? He found one. And then in the bot lane, they were able to retain Berserker, who's going to stay on as Vulcan returns to Cloud9. Clearly, on paper, regardless of what anybody else does, probably the best roster you could assemble with majority North American players. There's only one import on this team, and that's Berserker. So in a world where last year, NRG was heralded for being like this America's team of underdeveloped like North American players, and everybody else was importing, including Cloud9, Cloud9 now looks to be the premier team that is not only taking the best pieces that exist here in our ecosystem, but just putting them all together and who knows, maybe this will work. But super teams have had a tendency to fail over the last two years. I don't think that's going to be the case with this roster. They are, they just, they're too good. Like, I, I don't see this happening. FlyQuest, the reason why it failed in prior years was like, the reason why there was a, at least a little bit of hesitancy with these super teams is because you didn't know what was fully coming with Prince and with Vikla. Yes, we knew they were good over an LCK, but the majority of us LCS fans aren't able to watch those games that are on at like 3 a.m. So we were relying upon other people. And guess what? Now we know every piece of this. And I can promise you, they're gonna do good. Expectation should be to win every single split. FlyQuest is the one other known quantity for the most part so far. In top lane, they are bringing back Blippo, who pretty much sat out all last year as Team Liquid did their LCK experiment, and he just kind of got stuck being a content creator. Jungle, they picked up Inspired, who has been sitting in limbo as well. Notably, Inspired was just now that he got his green card, which means that they now have an open spot to import in mid lane because they have a native bot lane in both Masu and Busio, who is coming over from 100 Thieves. As a 100 Thieves fan, not gonna lie to you, that stings a lot. I mean, at least he's going back to Papa Smithy, who was one of the guys who helped raise him uh, in Academy and in Challengers. But yeah, that's that's where we stand, unfortunately, as 100 Thieves fans. It's not a pretty sight. But for FlyQuest, I don't know who they're gonna import in mid lane. Larson is the first name that comes to my mind, at least from Europe. I don't know if they wanna go LCK, but I think Europe would probably be better if they're gonna import given that Larson's like the cream of the crop talent over there. And I think that roster could be good. I'm not saying it's on Cloud9's level. I definitely think they have the potential to be, especially if this bot lane can challenge Berserker and Vulcan. Then I think you have some real firepower. Inspired has already shown that he can keep up with Blabber. Whippo has proven himself many times over, and they just have a very explosive play style that could work out very, very well. It's a much higher octane than what you would see on Cloud9. We only know a few other pieces, and that is for 100 Thieves, you do have Sniper coming in in the top lane. He's the prodigal uh, top lane talent that we've been waiting on for a few years now. He is notably the brother of Viper, who played with FlyQuest back when, and his younger brother is even like a challenger player in the league as well. The whole family is just obnoxiously good at the game. For Immortals, you're seeing Mask, who was in T1's development system, coming over in mid lane, already using up one of their import spots. And for Team Liquid, Impact is making his return to the organization who has been constantly rotating top laners since Impact left in, what, 2021? Somewhere around there. It was Alfari, then it was Summit, and they're finally getting back to at least something a little bit more stable and less volatile, which is good. But the main focus of this video is not to talk about roster moves. We'll talk about rosters and grade them whenever everything is all said and done. It's more to talk about some of the discussions that seem to be ongoing involving the LCS and some of the team decisions. The first is a possible day change for the LCS going back to Saturday, Sunday as leaked by I Will Dominate. I don't know whether this is actually going to happen. I'm not an insider. I'm just a content creator talking about all this. But that is the one thing that has to happen 
this offseason. For those that don't know, Riot actually just finished their remote broadcast center up in Seattle. Remote broadcast centers are something that is very familiar to traditional sports and television. CBS has theirs over on 57th Street. ABC has theirs up on the Upper West Side here in New York. But you have these centers where all of your feed gets distributed. Basically, like you can record from anywhere and all of the production that would normally happen on site, at least for Riot, is now going to happen in Seattle. And you basically shove everything out there and then they distribute it to Twitch, to YouTube, and everywhere else that it needs to go. This now frees us up. If we want to play on the weekends, we can go anywhere we want. I don't know whether that means a remote broadcast of like teams individually playing from their facilities, but say we want to rent out a location somewhere else to play, we could just to make sure that we're back on the weekend because the change to weekends was one of the worst if not the worst decision that i've ever seen in the lcs bar none i am tired of hearing reasons from riot of why we should cater to a global audience for the north american product it is north america you go for the time zone that is best for us as viewers because we are the people that are going to pay to go see your events that are going to pay to keep this esports alive and make sure that your sponsors get recognized enough to the point where they are retained yet we are that audience not europe not korea not china so i'm praying to god this year was a good lesson to the lcs to not forget your freaking base that also goes for teams with the majority of the top talent already settled and where they're gonna go to teams focus now shifts to the mid tier and bottom tier of the lcs where teams need to make the decision are we going to properly develop rosters and believe in North American talent and try and bring them up or do the stupid importing and roster construction that we've been doing and been on a cycle for for years now and I cannot stand it. I truly believe the reason why we are so down on North America as a region or why people at least give that perception is because we continuously pass up on the chance to believe in our own players and our own region. NRG is a great example of a team that finally overcame that. They set a three-year plan that was based around developing promising players that have been passed up in North America like Palafox, like Dokla, like Contracts, constantly tinkering the pieces around them to see if it can work and you know what? Hey, it did. They ended up winning a title. So going into this year, looking at this as a biased 100 Thieves fan, I want to see our team be based around enabling Sniper, and if Quid is the other player that you want to develop around, fine, Quid. I would personally add one more younger player in there as well, but I want to see you develop a roster that is specifically designed to bring out the best in them, to develop them over the course of the year so that, yes, you can begin to slot more pieces as time goes on, as your budget increases, as more opportunities become available, and as these players make a name for themselves, they will naturally attract better talent to them. That, uh, unless you know League of Legends. What's that? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah. If you know the game League of Legends, that's pretty much it. No, you're fine. Go right ahead. No problem. Follow me on Instagram, A W G I N G. My birthday on Friday. Follow me on Instagram, as a door explorer. I appreciate that. Have a cool guy. That's filming in New York for you, I guess. Anyways, I just want to see smart roster construction. I want to see teams actually have a three year long goal in mind and not just feel like we're throwing things together for the sake of throwing things together. It's fine to be a budget team as we try and hit profitability for every team in this region, not just Cloud9 who is confirmed to be so. But you want to be budget, but able to sustain yourself towards a future point and a future goal. Otherwise, if you're somebody like EG, for example, that we don't know really what's going on or Golden Guardians, it's just blatantly apparent that you want to sell your spot then. And in that case, I just think there should be some sort of repercussion from the org side of like, hey, you are clearly not trying. We're going to fine you or something. Like, I don't, there's got to be some sort of penalty or punishment for like not giving it a competitive effort. The final bit of news is actually a little bit more of a downer is that NRG has let go of two of their key staff who helped build up the NRG program to where it is right now, or it was CLG, and that is John and Myra. Both are incredibly good at their jobs and what they did, but unfortunately due to budget cuts of NRG as they try and hit profitability and sustainability going forward, they had to get the ax. Now I saw a lot of the community freaking out 
about these moves because they saw it as, oh my God, these people brought you a title, they brought you everything, they built the system that allowed you to get there in the first place. And I will just say this, at least in my opinion, while it was great that NRG won their title and was able to do well at Worlds, clearly there wasn't that expectation of going that far. NRG clearly seemed like they were going to make moves in this direction the entire time. So it was a matter of ripping off the Band-Aid and when. Had they lost earlier, it wouldn't have seemed as big of a deal. But it is important to note that I do think the majority of the credit for this LCS title does go to the foundation that was built by CLG, by Greg Kim, and everybody else within that group. Without them setting the pillars, NRG would not have been in this position. They literally got gifted a lot of this. Now, 20% or so of, of that credit does go to NRG, who gave the resources that would allow them to pick up FBI and Ignar, because without them, they would not have won this title to be very But the overwhelming majority of that credit does go to NRG, and it begs the question, who is the right person to let go in this situation? In a world where you personally are general manager and you have to make cuts and save funds somewhere, where you're trying to keep your roster intact, you're trying to keep your coaches, you're trying to keep everything around you as stable as it possibly can be, who do you get rid of to try and hit that goal? And the answer is not nobody. You have to make a decision and cut somebody. And I think if you're looking at NRG scenario and they can potentially get rid of those two roles while delegating that responsibility to others, that makes the most amount of sense. Not saying that it's, it's a good thing that this happened, obviously. But it's just one of those that you get rid of the positional coaches that allowed the players to thrive. I don't think the players hit their peak. You reduce the salaries of the players so much. I don't think you were able to retain this roster. And I don't know what other move to make. Now, the problem is going to be what happens when you need to make changes. You are getting rid of the people that were very key and instrumental to making those changes. And that's going to be where we see the NRG systems in process. How is whatever they're designing from this point forward without John, without Myra, how is that going to be able to handle any problems that get thrown their way? As for John and Myra, I do wish them the best. I've talked to John extensively. I've talked to Myra off and on. They are great people who have obviously shown incredible work as is evident by their now LCS title. And they will be on a team somewhere. I can promise you that. They will not get passed up. They are too good of people to not get another chance, or well, not even another chance, just to get picked up by somebody. But this does bring me into the announcement to close this all out. Andy Miller, the owner of NRG, is going to be coming on the Crossover Podcast tomorrow night at 10 p.m. I've talked to Andy a few times before. He agreed to come on. All questions are open and available, and I'm going to ask him about everything. So we're going to be talking for a bit. I don't know how long he's going to stay on. Paul and I will probably be live for about two hours, but we're going to cover everything from him wanting to get into League of Legends, when that started, the journey to picking up a team in CLG, to winning the title, to what's the direction of the organization going forward, and his thoughts on LCS issues. It's all going to be asked. So tomorrow at 10 p.m., I hope to see you there. Anyways, that is it for me on this video. Just a quick recap of all the news surrounding LCS. There's been so much that I don't think I can dedicate a single video to any one topic without missing some stuff. So going forward, I promise you, it will be a little bit more focused than this, but there was just too much to touch on that I needed to consolidate it down. And the pit is not formally back until the beginning of the year. So for now, it's just us chatting. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to drop a like down below and subscribe, and I will catch you on the next one. Adios.